if any of you ever went to a small country school in primary school, uh, it became maybe, it was a little easier to become king of the village there, right? If you were in uh, a small little school, it might have been, I know I visited some primary schools where there, there were maybe four or five people per year group, or right? maybe like a small little, tiny little Shkainarinki, Shkainarinka, for example, tiny little school, uh, which has about like 30 students in the whole school, you know? So you can be in that school, small little primary school, and uh, you're pretty good at whatever it is, subjects, your, your academics, or your, your sport, and it all looks fine and dandy until you go to the town school for secondary school and realize that you were just a big fish in a small pond. And now that you're in a big pond, you ain't nothing special, right? I remember when I went to, when I went to university, uh, I would have been an okay student uh, in secondary school. Then I went to university to UL through electronic engineering. And uh, mamma mia, that was uh, quite the change. Lots of achievers there in my class. Uh, so the academic standard was just ballistic through the roof. So often when it comes to our faith, life, there's a real danger of just comparing ourselves to a fairly low standard around us, right? Okay, so if you were to ask yourself, well, how's my faith? Well, it's, I mean, it's fairly okay, like, I mean, I haven't killed anyone. Now, killing people is definitely to be avoided, absolutely. But this is not the standard for having a good faith, right? Or you might say, well, I haven't killed anyone, and I go to Mass regularly. Or you know, I haven't killed anyone, or maybe someone will say, and I believe in God. Okay, again, belief in God is a good thing. If, if, you, if you do so, continue to do so. If you don't do so, consider doing so. Uh, but belief in God really is not the goal, okay? And yet, like you could imagine if any of our politicians came out tomorrow morning and in some statement said, you know, and, and I believe in God, most of us would be like, well, fair play. Like, that's, that's quite the statement. I mean... For a politician to say publicly that they believe in God, that's, uh, that's definitely politically incorrect. And yet, if they said so, so what? Have they said anything extraordinary? Nope. That should be the most ordinary thing in the world to say that you believe in God. Of course you believe in God. Of course you believe in God. I mean, it should be really, really ordinary. So again, belief in God, it, it, it's not the goal, okay? So there are different kind of levels of how our faith influences our lives. And the danger is that if we just compare ourselves to the people around us, we might think we're doing fairly okay. The real standard, though, is what God thinks of us. And that's the only standard that matters. Okay, so we might say, well, I believe in God, and that might be a good enough standard. Mm. Okay, is God part of your life? Well, hopefully he'll be a fairly substantial part of the end of my life. And like from then on, yeah. But right, right now, like, is is God a part of your life now? A very easy way to judge that is, well, how much time do you give him? Again, if we're just really concrete about this, like, how much time do I give God? So if I say I believe in Him, and I give Him zero time, that belief actually, it, it's going to be fruitless. It's it's not going to be much help to you. Because you haven't allowed God into your life. You haven't allowed him to transform your life. And therefore, you're also refusing, like, for example, his healing, his guidance. Because I don't want it. I just, just want to believe in him and leave him over there, if that's all right. But he's not really part of my life. But wait, there is more. Is it enough to say that God is part of my life? Even that is actually not enough, right? God is part of my life, you know? I have my hobbies. I have my aspirations for the future. I have my career, my family. I have my dog. I have my love for wood turning, whatever it may be. And I have my God. And he fits in there nicely amongst all my other various things that I've accumulated over the years. So God is part. Again, we might actually be patting ourselves on the back for saying, Actually, I'm not, doing, not, not the worst, actually. You know, God is part of my life. And again, that's if he is, great. But that's, again, not actually the goal. The goal is not that we just believe in God or that he's part of our lives. So I think there's a, a step further we can go. 
which is the beginning of a whole new chapter, which we won't go into, but what should our faith cost us? What should we give to our faith? What are we willing to give for heaven? The answer should be everything. So God isn't just part of my life, but he's actually the center of it. I don't just believe in him, but I follow him and act, hopefully, on his inspiration. So my faith doesn't cost me a little bit of time on a Sunday morning, but it costs me my, my life. Because everything I do, everything I do, I do out of love for him, everything. I, all the joys I have, I enjoy. I enjoy them as gifts from God. Any of the sufferings that I have, I carry them through the grace of God, unite them with his, cro- with his cross. So my whole day, everything, everything, becomes actually centered around God, even though I'm not in the church, I don't have rosary beads in my hand. Everything I do is centered around God, indirectly. And everything I do, I can do out of love for him. Everything, from changing nappies, cutting potatoes, to filling the stove with coal. I mean, everything, anything, all of these things. So then your whole life, actually, starts to center around God. And when we start there, then that, that, start, that opens a whole other paragraph, which we'll just skim off. It's, it's something we spoke about before. You know, the, the mystics talk about the purgative way. So in our spiritual development, we start to clean our life out from all of the bad habits and hobbies and thoughts and attachment to sin. Then there's the illuminative way where we become much more steadfast in our regular prayer life and in our self-donation to God. And then there's the unitive way where we live a life completely united with God and where even our sufferings become a joy because they give us something to offer to God. That's another homily. So, so again, what, what is, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the point here? The point is that our faith isn't just that we believe in God or that God is part of my life, but it's actually that God is the center, which doesn't mean we have to be priests or religious, by the way. You can, you can be a farmer and till fields and top fields and planch buds and the whole lot on your tractor and be a, a saint, a man of God, offering everything and doing everything out of love for God. Absolutely. So this is the kind of life that we're called to. Is, uh, it's radical. It's a radical call. Not just to compare ourselves to what people in general are doing or, or a lot of people are doing. But what's God asking of me? Well, he's asking for everything. He's asking for your heart. And he does so by becoming, taking on the form of the most helpless and harmless and endearing stage of human life, that of a baby. No one is intimidated to see Jesus in the crib. No one is intimidated by a child. And so he takes on this this helpless form so that we won't be intimidated by God. And that we see the lengths that he's willing to go to, from the crib to the cross, to prove his love for us, so that we can respond to his love for us with our love for him. Not just giving him a part of our heart, but by giving him everything. So we ask the good Lord today to renew our faith in this Advent, in this season of preparation for Christmas that it might be a season of preparation for a new form of self-donation to God. That all might be done out of love for him and that we can walk with him every day of our lives. Amen.